everyone. Sorry for the small delay. There has been a, a small glitch with the transport. We anyway, we are uh, all back. So uh, we have the, the pleasure to, to welcome uh, Glenn Bank from the University of Innsbruck, who will continue the introduction of uh, related to foundations of uh, quantum computing. And after this course, there will be a welcome reception that is going to take place on the terrace where we had lunch. Okay. Okay. So thank you very much. Uh, so as uh, probably you know, I'm going to speak today about uh, uh, adiabatic quantum computation. So let me start by giving a few references on the topic. So just uh, 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 an overview. Is going to be this uh, uh, recent uh, review by Albash and Lidar. Named uh, Adiabati. Quantum computation. So this is uh, a review of modern physics. So from 2018. So here you're going to find basically all the references you can uh, uh, about the topic, and uh, you're going to find uh, the latest uh, results and uh, the references to the latest results and latest theorems in this topic. And, uh, but this is not uh, very self-contained. It's not uh, a, an introduction. It's just uh, a review. So if you want to uh, read something which is self-contained, and uh, I'm going to recommend for you the lecture notes by Charles Andrew. And it's going to be lecture notes on quantum algorithms. So here you have uh, an introduction to the topic, which is uh, self-contained. And uh, if you are willing to read it in depth, there are also rigorous proofs uh, about the statement that are mentioned. So till now, uh, you have probably seen the gate model right, for quantum computing. So in this model, uh, essentially what happens is that the system uh, undergoes a sequence of gates that form a circuit. So I'm going to go pretty fast on this because you have already seen it. And uh, the final result is going to be remeasured, and you're going to get output. So in, in this, in this uh, kind of approach, you have what is, uh, would be a digital uh, uh, quantum computation model, because you're applying uh, these digital gates, so these elements. While now I'm going to discuss Adiabatic quantum computation. So 
So, and this model is quite different because instead of being digital, it's going to be analog, and uh, the system. is going to be evolved with a certain time dependent Hamiltonian. And uh, we are, yes, sorry, OK. Yes, maybe. And still make measurements at the end, and you're gonna always get an output. So here, the dynamics is governed by the Schrodinger equation, uh, that uh, uh, which uh, is uh, implemented by this time-dependent Hamiltonian, and the output again should be the solution of your uh, computational problem. So. Why would we try to do this uh, uh, kind of approach, and why is it called quantum adi uh, adiabatic quantum computation? So the reason is that the goal in the end is to prepare the system in, uh, uh, let's say, C out is going to be ground state of h uh, of, of the final time, which is the final Hamiltonian. So the output is going to, we want the output to be more or less the ground state of a final Hamiltonian. And we want that the ground state of this final Hamiltonian uh, would be encoding the problem. So the reason why we do this is because in physics, we more or less have techniques to prepare ground states of Hamiltonians. We have techniques to prepare ground states of Hamiltonians. And uh, the idea is to apply these techniques in this case to come up with a new computational uh, uh, with, with a new algorithm and model for computation. So, so now the question is, how can we prepare the ground state of a certain Hamiltonian uh, given a certain time with a time evolution, with, with, with a Schrodinger evolution? And this can be done uh, relying on the adiabatic theorem, which is the backbone of adiabatic quantum computation. So let me state it. So, so the adiabatic theorem, first of all, let's, uh, before stating it, let's try to discuss what are the ingredients. So we have an Hamiltonian, H of t, which is time dependent. So this Hamiltonian, being time dependent, is going to have uh, a spectrum, which is also time dependent. So we can solve the time independent Schrodinger equation, uh, the gain value problem for each independent time. So we will then get such a spectrum that's going to be given by Let's say this, the energies and the uh, eigenvectors as a function of time. 
Ah, sorry, game bigger. <laughs> sorry. Oh, this is the right size. Okay, let me. <laughs> Hopefully. So, okay, so from here, as we said, So the Hamiltonian is going to have eigenstate and eigenvalues, which depend on time and satisfy the following equation. So if I apply the Hamiltonian to, the, to an eigenstate, it should just get uh, be multiplied by the eigenvalue. Okay, so we have this, and uh, if we look at the Hamiltonian, uh, at, the, at the spectrum of the Hamiltonian as a function of time, and we're gonna have energy levels, and we diagonalize the Hamiltonian and look at the spectrum at each time. So would have the first energy level, which is going to do something like this, which will depend on the time, would have, uh, yeah, let's call it, uh, I'll put it on top because this is a function. And so this is an A0, it's not a, an important, uh, because it's small, it's not really important. And then you're going to have other levels for, let's say, this is going to be for the state uh, 0 of t, this is going to be for the state 1 of t, and et cetera, et cetera, for all the levels of the Hamiltonians, OK? And uh, we make the hypothesis that these levels do not cross, in particular, that uh, the ground state, so A0, it's always different, or in this case, since it's the ground state, A0, uh, AM of T is, is going to be always greater uh, than A0 of T, meaning that this cannot happen. Okay, so this is not contemplated within the, the theorem as I will be stating it now. And uh, having this hypothesis, we can now start stating what the theorem says. The theorem says that if we start from an initial state, say of zero, which is the ground state at time zero. And then we let the system evolve with the Schrodinger equation. So Okay. In the end, we are going to get that the state of the system at time t, psi of t, is going to be, let's say, approximately, approximately proportional to the to the ground state at time t. Okay, so this is saying that 
And the, for this condition to hold, we have to have a sufficiently sm slow evolution. So I'll write it here because it's quite important. So if the Hamiltonian is changing sufficiently slowly, what will happen is that the state would always remain in this, in the, in the ground, in the continuous ground state, the evolved state. And, and thus, I can use this idea to prepare uh, the ground state of a final Hamiltonian, starting from the ground state of an initial Hamiltonian. So before describing uh, in detail how we use, uh, we can use this in, uh, uh, in quantum computing, I want to spend uh, a few seconds, uh, like a few minutes, uh, discussing the proof and the bounds that are related to this, uh, to this theorem. So, uh, okay, I'll just delete this. So, so this is, to, to make this uh, statement, uh, to give a quantitative statement, we, we need to be a bit more precise than what I've said here. So we are going to consider that the Hamiltonian, H of t, is, uh, let's say, it's going to be, equal to uh, h of s with s equal t over the total time. So we can take, uh, if we want to be more precise, let's say we are evolving with h prime of t, which is equal to this function. And now, uh, in this case, we can rewrite the Schrodinger equation as, uh, as a function uh, using the variable s. And uh, we are going to get that uh, we are going to have a psi of s. And we are going to have that for this psi of s, the derivative in s. is going to be equal to minus t for psi of s, uh, and of course the h of s, sorry. <laughs> okay, so in this case, by doing the ch this change of variables, we get uh, a, a time here, and uh, this change of variable is uh, quite relevant because this parameter allows us to slow down the evolution. So the Hamiltonian, for example, we can take as final point uh, uh, h of s0, initial point, going to h of s equal 1. OK? And this, in terms of the time, is going to happen within a, a time from 0 to capital T. So by sending capital T to infinity, I make this dynamic slower and slower, because it takes more time to reach, to, uh, to reach the final Hamiltonian. So I have to be doing this change uh, slower. OK, so, so this is the, the setting. And uh, with this setting, it's uh, possible to uh, start uh, attempting to prove the theorem. So I'm going to give not a rigorous proof of the theorem, which you can find uh, uh, in the lecture notes from Childs, because this is maybe not the right place to, to prove the whole theorem. But I just want to give 
some uh, idea on how the theorem works, on how to prove the theorem, and what comes out from the theorem. Because other than knowing that if we send t to infinity, uh, the, the, the dynamics is going to uh, be adiabatic, so it's going to stay in the ground state, would like to know how large t has to be for this kind of uh, statement to hold. OK, so I'm going here. So to make the proof, the first part of the proof is going to be to find uh, an exact uh, adiabatic evolution. So we say that this Hamiltonian, when, when this condition hold, will be approximately in the ground state. But we want to find uh, an Hamiltonian which uh, we want to define an Hamiltonian, an alternative Hamiltonian, HA, uh, of S. which is going to be T H of S plus I P dot P. So here P is the projector over over the instantaneous eigenstate. So uh, if we want to be precise here, we should put S. But uh, I will uh, drop the S where they are like, uh, where, so I, I may drop the S where it's uh, implicit. Most that all these things except T are going to be S dependent. So, so the first statement is that this is going to be uh, implement the ex an exact adiabatic dynamics. So if I evolve uh, with uh, so if I evolve with uh, with this Hamiltonian, I'm going to have that uh, the Schrodinger the, the Schrodinger equation can be satisfied. So let's say Schrodinger equation for a. Oh, sorry. <laughs> OK, so we say that if this, so the main thing here is that what, what, what does it mean that this implements an, uh, the exact adiabatic evolution? It means that if I take psi a, of S, which satisfies the Schrodinger equation uh, for with with H A, okay. So if I consider this uh, Schrodinger equation, then uh, with initial condition. that I'm starting from the ground state. Then I'll have that the, a solu the solution is psi A of S equal to a coefficient times the instantaneous eigenstate. So wait, let's put S here, because we want to keep everything in terms of S. So this is going to be 
a solution with, of this uh, equation with some appropriate uh, uh, C0, okay? And this means that this, the first step is showing, the, is defining the, an Hamiltonian which does the job exactly, which is implementing an exact adiabatic solution. The next thing that you would have to do to for the proof, uh, yes. So the next thing that you'd have to do for the proof is showing that if I take the evolution operator, uh, let's say, I would say UA and U are close. So here, the evolution operator UA is the, evolu is the, evo is the evolution operator induced by the, this Hamiltonian, by the adi exact adiabatic uh, Hamiltonian, so it's gonna be satisfying the equation A, uh, HA UA, and uh, the, the uh, U is going to be the adiabatic, the, the evolution implemented by our original Hamiltonian. And this is going to be satisfying the H U. So again, both of these are, uh, yeah, sorry, here yeah, the derivative, of course. Again, both of these are function of S. Okay, and as I said, everything except T is basically a function of S. So, in this case, these two, uh, uh, I, I know the uh, differential equation satisfied by these two uh, operators by, by these two evolution operators and uh, the, uh, the idea is that I want to show from this that u a minus u this should be uh, small. for t that goes to infinity. So, after defining the evolution, the, the, the main point, as we said, we have defined the exact adiabatic evolution, and then the, the, the idea is to show that the exact adiabatic evolution is actually close to the, to the, uh, to the, evolution operator induced uh, by the time-dependent Hamiltonian, the original one, when the process is slow enough, so when t is going to infinity. And uh, finally, again, the third step here, uh, which I will, okay, I'll write here. So the third step is going to be to put some conditions. So. is going to be to say how large t should be. Okay, so these uh, are the steps that uh, uh, lead to the proof. I've not proved uh, none of them at the moment, but I want to simply 
start by proving the first one at least because it's uh, uh, it will uh, show it will give us the evolution the state which is and the phases which are actually um, implemented by this slow evolution in the limit of t that goes to infinity. So um, again, let me start by, so as we said, this here, so I'll look at the first step. And we say that this is going to be our h of s, OK? And uh, the idea uh, in this first step is to show that, as we said, that the Schrodinger dynamic, the, this, satisfies the Schrodinger equation. So let's write that explicitly. So if this is uh, this will satisfy the Schrodinger equation, if we are going to have that the derivative of let me just write here that this is the wave function, okay, the state, and we are going to have that uh, the derivative of of the state. should be uh, plus the part due to the Hamiltonian. OK, uh, let's just keep the S out for consistency. So, this should be equal to zero uh, if uh, we want that uh, the Schrodinger equation is satisfied, because I just brought everything on one side in the Schrodinger equation. OK. So we can uh, uh, start writing this and see what comes out. So uh, I'm going to, the first part is going to be uh, here. So since there are going to be a few derivatives, I'm going to use the notation x dot equal the S of X. Okay. And this is going to be the first part. And the second part, we have to put in the Hamiltonian. So we're going to use the given value equation. So since A0 is an again value of, an again vector of HS, this is going to be. E zero times E zero, and then we're going to have plus this term. So, uh, so, so plus, and we're going to have E times uh, uh, E. P dot P. OK. And this still applied to E0. So let's put here the coefficient because of linearity. The C0 goes out from this application. So uh, yeah, 
Okay, so to be consistent, actually, if we, if we want to keep the h bar, sorry here, I forgot an h bar. Okay, so here we're going to have a1 over h bar, and we're going to have an h bar. Okay, so this equation, in this, in this equation, actually, what we would like to simplify to uh, resolve like to, to simplify is this object so let's write what this object is uh, yeah So we are going to have p dot p applied to e0, which is going to be uh, I just recall one second that p is e0, e0. Okay, and this here is going to give uh, it's zero dot comma. Oh, sorry, I'll write this here. Okay, and this is going to be e <coughs> zero dot e zero. Uh, okay, and and e zero. Okay, so now. We're going to insert this in uh, the equation, but I'm not going to do the computation uh, bit by bit. I'm just going to give you the result for this one. And uh, what you're going to get is that you're going to have You're going to have that when you insert this inside here, you're going to have that the, the Schrodinger equation, which should be 0, is going to be actually C dot is 0 plus, uh, so plus. Each bar uh, uh, is zero, and this is going to be uh, plus. Let me just get you the right sign for the last term. And you're going to have minus i zero dot. OK. And this is going to multiply e0. So what happens 
is that uh, the Schrodinger, all the terms in the, in, the, in the equation vanish except those that multiply uh, directly the single against state is zero, and then we have an equation with just coefficient on a single vector. And this equation, uh, uh, yeah, sorry, here yeah, of course there is a C zero missing. And this equation has a solution, which is going to be that uh, the C of, uh, of uh, T, or of S in this case, is going to be uh, an exponential of a dynamical phase. Uh -huh. and uh, a geometric phase. Uh, okay, times, uh, times uh, the C at one, and we will, uh, by, because of the initial condition C zero at one, this is simply going to be the value of C. And here, the phases are given by the in, uh, are, are the integrals of these objects that appear here. And gamma is going to be the integral of uh, I zero is zero dot. Okay, so. So what would happen is that this, the state would approximately evolve acquiring, let's say, simul, uh, these two different phases. One is uh, simply what you would uh, expect in a usual Hamiltonian, which is uh, in a usual Hamiltonian, if I, uh, you would acquire a phase proportional to the energy times the time, if the Hamiltonian is time independent. In this case, you have to, the, the, the E depends on the time, so you'd have to integrate this. And uh, in the second term is uh, due to the uh, to its a geometrical phase, which plays uh, uh, an important role. For example, when you want to consider cycles which return at the initial point. But in this case, uh, the what we are mainly interested in is. Uh, in the dynamical phase, and uh, I just want to mention that if you proceed in doing, uh, in, uh, in, uh, proceed in uh, proving the theorem, you'd find that uh, the oscillations that are induced by the dynamical phase are what uh, essentially allow you to prove the theorem, because you're going to have that uh, the uh, eigenstate is uh, the that the state is uh, having uh, uh, f that the, the, the different st that the state is having phases which or she, which uh, are high, and uh, you're gonna have that uh, when you compute integrals, these phases are gonna appear in the exponential, and you're gonna have to uh, integrate by parts to uh, or to obtain. Uh, a bound for the error. So let me, uh, I'll skip this part because it's uh, quite uh, technical, and I'm just gonna give you the result uh, for the bound. So, Okay, so if you 
finally attempt to estimate how far it's uh, your state from uh, so how far it's your evolution from the exact uh, adiabatic evolution you're going to have that this you're going to be able to write uh, a, uh, this equation this is going to be let's say uh, you're going to have an error which is smaller or equal than times some constant. So you're going to have uh, an error, which is, uh, uh, OK, here you have uh, uh, a total time. So you're going to have like that the error times the total time. It's, uh, uh, it's uh, let's say, it's smaller than the uh, norm of the uh, derivative of the Hamiltonian, but that is at the gap square, where the gap square uh, is The gap is the, let's say, is going to be the difference. Let me write it here, and I'll then draw it. It's going to be 1 of t minus e0 of t. And you're going to have that, as we said, you're going to have these two objects. And we are considering this difference between the E0 state and the E1 state. And here, you would have to take of this quantity is defined for some value of S. And you'll have to take the maximum. So actually, let me write it uh, explicitly that uh, you have to take the maximum <coughs> okay so so this is what uh, uh, the theorem states that the error that uh, we define, and uh, it's telling us how close the uh, state of the evolved state is to the exact the state implemented by the exact adiabatic Hamiltonian. And uh, this error, if I call it epsilon, so if I call the error epsilon, let's say here, I'm going to have that the time needed to achieve an error epsilon is going to be 1 over epsilon times a constant uh, times the maximum over s of h dot. Square of s. So this is telling us that uh, again, as I said, I'm calling epsilon the error. OK? So this is telling us that if we want to keep a certain uh, fixed error, so we want the final, uh, for example, the final state to be uh, pretty close uh, up to epsilon to uh, the ground state of the final Hamiltonian, we are going to have to uh, increase the time, because when we reduce epsilon, the time is going to increase. But on the other hand, uh, it's, uh, also uh, it's also telling us that uh, to achieve, when we have a fixed epsilon, we can uh, achieve uh, a, a sufficiently uh, good performance if we choose the time 
large enough. And what is the physical, uh, what are the physical quantities that are defining how large this time has to be? These physical quantities are the derivative of the Hamiltonian and, and the gap. So let's say if, uh, for example, the derivative for some reason is constant, we are going to have that uh, the time is going to be uh, scaling with uh, uh, the inverse of uh, the, the square of the gap, the time to have a certain error epsilon. So this is uh, uh, the adiabatic approximation because it tells, it, this uh, equation tells us um, This equation tells us how long we need, uh, how much time we need to actually achieve a certain precision. And uh, now I want to describe how this is used in, uh, briefly describe how this is used in uh, adiabatic quantum computation. Yep, so I'm going to use the last few seconds. So for this, I'm going to just finally describe the, the algorithm. And uh, like tomorrow, I will show practical examples. But today, it's just about understanding what the algorithm is and what are the uh, theoretical foundation of the algorithm. So if we start from a certain Hamiltonian, let's say uh, h of i, an initial Hamiltonian, and we want to end in a final Hamiltonian, which uh, encodes the the problem, the, the solution of the of 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 a, of a problem. So. To do this, we would have to restrict, uh, it's easier actually, to restrict ourselves to some uh, uh, opt combinatorial optimization problem. So we consider the problem of uh, minimizing uh, a certain function, let's say uh, h uh, defined on binary to r. OK, so we consider this problem. Mean of h of z. So th this is uh, an optimization problem, because we are given a, fun a classical function, and we want to find the uh, the zeta that minimize the function. So actually, many problems can be uh, written in this kind of form, and uh, also quite complicated problems, uh, which are uh, NP-hard. And uh, uh, for example, uh, like the satisfiability uh, problems, the traveling salesman problems, and I will discuss some of them tomorrow. Uh, and also the Grover problem that you already saw can also be written in this, uh, in, in, in this kind of uh, shape. So if you have a problem which can be recast in the finding the minimum of this, uh, of this function, finding the minimum of this function can be again recast in the question of finding the ground set of a certain Hamiltonian. So we consider this Hamiltonian, which is going to be the sum over all uh, the possible strings, z, of, and we define the Hamiltonian, we define the, a diagonal Hamiltonian. So the elements of the diagonal are given exactly by h, and uh, the And the, eigen and, and the eigenvectors are exactly this. 
uh, and uh, the eigenvectors are exactly the computational basis. So again, z is going to be a string, as we said, with this, each of these values can be 0 or 1. So, so this can be seen as a, a state defined on a set of n qubits. So we have that this Hamiltonian n uh, is, uh, is, uh, lives in the, in the space uh, of, uh, of uh, n qubits. And uh, this, the, final, the ground state of the final Hamiltonian, since the Hamiltonian is diagonal and we already know the energies, is going to be the uh, state which has the minimal energy. So in this case, it's going to be the state which has the minimal h of z. So it's also going to be the state which minimizes. Uh, which, it's also be going to be the state z which minimizes our function. So the ground state of this problem is going to be uh, let's say uh, is zero of uh, t equal capital T at the end of the evolution is going to be the uh, zeta bar star so that zeta bar star is the minimum of our initial problem. And uh, in this case, we can, we can use the adiabatic theorem to generate an Hamiltonian that produces this, this, uh, the ground state of, the, of this problem. And to do this, we consider the following Hamiltonian. So the interpolating Hamiltonian, H of S, which is going to be uh, uh, let's say, let me give you a, a simple form, but this can be changed. So, so this is going to be S times H final plus 1 minus S times H initial. And we recall that S is T over T. So in this case, I'm giving you, uh, this would be a particular case where I've chosen a linear schedule. As we'll see, this may not be necessarily the best one, but uh, at time zero, uh, the Hamiltonian is HI. So it's going to be H of S equals zero is going to be HI, and H of S equal one is going to be HF. Okay, and if I run, if I am able to prepare the system in the initial state, which is one of the requirements for the adiabatic theorem, so that I, I must be able to prepare this initial state, which is the ground state of the initial Hamiltonian, then the adiabatic theorem assures us that uh, uh, this uh, evolving with this Hamiltonian is going to uh, generate the solution we are looking for. OK, so, so this is uh, essentially how things are going to work. And for the time I need, because we said that this, uh, I, I need a certain amount of time to do this. And the time I need is going to be dictated by the derivatives of the, that Hamiltonian and its uh, minimal gap. So I can get the runtime of the algorithm uh, up with a certain precision. So this is a runtime at fixed precision by computing this object. So the analysis for uh, when running this kind of algorithm for uh, a certain problem is going to be uh, write an Hamiltonian which interpolates uh, between an initial one and a final one. The final one should solve your problem of interest. And uh, the initial one should have a ground state which is sufficiently easy to prepare. So we should be able to do this uh, ground state preparation. And uh, 
after the evolution, if the time is uh, longer than a running time, which is, uh, uh, depends uh, uh, inversely uh, with the gap squared of the, of the Hamiltonian along the, uh, along the evolution path, the system is going to return the, gra the, the ground state of the finite Hamiltonian, which is also the solution of uh, our initial problem. So this is just uh, the, uh, let's say, the um, theoretical side. So let's how the algorithm should work in theory and. Uh, uh, tomorrow, I will uh, discuss uh, explicit examples for the algorithm, and I'm going to show how it actually works in practice for some specific problems. Okay.